Uh, so today is a continuation actually of last week by popular demands. Peter, you're popular and you're demanded back into the space. So we're thrilled to have your thoughts uh, uh, shared with folks uh, as, we, as we dive back into some of the challenges, particularly in regard to supporting our faculties and staffs as we're working through both on the one hand, celebrating the tremendous accomplishments of our teams to get through this spring. And on the other hand, starting to prepare them for the next set of challenges this fall, knowing that that next set of challenges is a bit different. Um, there were about 10 questions that we didn't get to last time. And Peter, I know you've collected some thoughts on those questions and, and wanna share them here at the beginning. I'm gonna suggest again, folks, if you have additional questions for Peter, please don't hesitate to put them into the Q&A area. And I will be monitoring that and going down that set of questions after Peter riffs on the initial set from last week. So Peter, can I turn it over to you to, to let folks know what some of those questions were and, and some of your thoughts? Sure, Brad, thank you. And I've, uh, I've done some reordering from the way that they showed up in the question queue uh, and done a, a little bit of consolidation. Um, I'm going to start with a question that is, uh, is, is hard, and there are a bunch of pretty hard questions. There are questions that take us to hard places. Uh, despite our faculty's best efforts, we are seeing our young learners regress socially and emotionally and become sadder as time passes. This is very hard for our faculty to accept because they are giving their students their all, their time, their flexibility, their complete commitment. They've never worked so hard in their lives. How do we encourage our exhausted and invested teachers to continue wholeheartedly when they know their impact has in some ways changed? Yeah, I mean, what, find me a school for whom this is not a truth. Mm -hmm. The response that I can offer is this, the teacher's impact may have changed, but the needs of their students have not. And this is a time for schools to dig into the challenges in a concerted, consistent way. It would be a gift to offer teachers some intentional and proven kinds of support so that they can fulfill their personal missions in supporting students. I know this is kind of a glib answer, but it's the strongest one I can offer. Find and then streamline and make universally available, if not required, some resources that can build the framework of empathy, support, trust, and love that define your school's community. There's never been a time when thinking about your school as an idea, as a promise, and as a community bound by common purpose has been as important as right now. We can have all of our regrets, but we and our teachers and our students and our families are all the, in this. We're stuck in it truly and irrevocably. And we have to make the best of it using the best of ourselves. That's not an easy answer. It's not an easy question. And I, I, I'm embarrassed to sound glib and, and as optimistic as I feel about this because I do believe we can get through it. Um, here's a question I'm gonna to toss to Brad. If there's a necessary reduction in workforce, do you have any advice on how and when it should be done? Oh, gosh, that's another tough one. <laughs> we're, we're diving into yes, the is. tough ones, aren't we, Peter? <laughs> oh, this is uh, the only oh. I, you know, I've, I've in my career had been in the unfortunate place of, of, of having to let faculty go um, and have found that uh, relying upon some sage advice from Brene Brown and, and being clear uh, is as kind as I can possibly be. Um, being clear around intentions, being clear around the reasons and rationale and being clear so that there is not um, a, a void that can be filled by a rumor mill or a void that can be filled by, um, by, by chatter. Um, I've also found perhaps contrary to what others experiences have been that the earlier that I can let folks know that decision, the better off the community is from a healing perspective and from a perspective of being able to celebrate, hopefully, some of the successes that those people had as members of our community, if that's at all possible. Um, we know that independent school professionals, whether they work in a third grade classroom or in a dining hall, care deeply about kids. 
And regardless of the person that may have to be furloughed or uh, whose job might be, not be there in the fall, the, that, that's a difficult, an incredibly difficult thing um, for them to take on. And, and so giving some space and opportunity to celebrate the successes that they had in the community, if that's possible, um, can help heal some of those wounds. Peter, does that feel okay to you? That feels as okay as, as this question can, can give us, I think. Um, this is a, it's a really hard time. The, another question that I'll, I'll, I'll offer a quick answer and throw this one back to Brad as well. Are there any summer trainings in online teaching that you can re recommend? One schoolhouse is currently full. Well, we are, but we're scrambling to find ways to expand our reach and our services. And maybe Brad can talk a little bit about that and maybe some alternatives that, uh, that I don't know about. Yeah, I, I'm happy to let folks know that we're trying desperately to get everybody who's on the wait list for the administrator's course into the June 8 version. And I think that we're gonna be able to. So if you're interested in the administrator training course for the summer, please do sign up uh, for that. Um, we've also, I think, been close to being able to clear out uh, a wait list for schools that are interested in our teacher training program. And we may be able to open up the wait list again um, for additional schools. Uh, we've honestly been a little bit surprised by the level of support that schools have been asking for from us uh, uh, going into the summer and are trying to do everything we possibly can to help as many teachers and kids uh, going into next year as we possibly can. I'd also note too, as many, well, you all know, you know, we are, we're trying to offer as many free resources out there too to schools, including um, the set of design and build and teaching standards that we've put up on our website, this academic leaders weekly webinar, our academic leaders uh, listserv, uh, and our weekly academic leaders meetup. Uh, it's been nice to see so many folks start to come into that academic leaders meetup as a way to connect with colleagues. We know that that's some of the most powerful learning that people can do right now is learning about emerging practices and best practices that schools have had this spring and they're thinking going into this fall. I, I, I'd Here also was the next to, one. Oh, oh, go ahead. Well, yeah. I'd wanna, I wanna chime in a little bit more on that. As far as the academic leaders listserv goes, um, a lot of the questions or the kinds of questions that we are seeing here in the webinar are also questions that have been posted to the listserv. And in the listserv, you have the possibility of um, eight or 900 people, I guess, at this point, who can, uh, who might be able to offer you a response. So if you have a query, uh, look there. If you uh, are looking for answers, look and see if somebody else has posted your, posted your query and uh, look for answers there. Um, the archives are available and searchable as well. So um, please use that resource. Uh, I think it's tremendously helpful for lots of people as listservs have been in my life for 20 years now. Me too, me too, Peter. So let's go on to the next question. I just wanna remind folks, if you have additional questions, feel free to put them into the Q&A area. We're happy to answer these. What we're doing right now, for those of you that are joining a little bit late, is working through the questions that we were unable to get to last week before jumping into the new questions, but I think there's only two or three more. So folks, feel free to show, uh, to put any questions that you might have into that Q&A area. Peter, what was the next one you got on the list? Sure, and I, this is, uh, I, I've kind of compressed a bunch of these as sort of an omnibus question. Um, and here's how it starts. When tremendous changes in order, how do we help our faculty reduce the who moved my cheese complex? Mm. Those of us who are old enough to remember who moved my cheese. Uh, related to that is that we cannot ignore that faculty have a lot of fears heading into September and that they need to identify and talk through these fears. To what extent do you believe that identifying teacher fears will allow us to move forward and approach the fall with a clearer vision and allow administration to more clearly understand faculty perspective um, along with this sort of what are ways to create buy-in from faculty and how do we help prevent teacher burnout? So all of these are, I'm gonna to try to answer these in one big glump. Um, so clump. Good luck uh, with that, Peter. Something. Yeah, well, uh, I'll do the best <laughs> I can. And that's 
all I can offer here. Well, you know, I'm thinking about this. When my car won't start, I can call AAA. We've got lots of known solutions to problems like that. And we've all learned in the last decade or so how important it is as educators and as schools to innovate, to design, think our way through stuff. This is different. It's way bigger than most of the things we've had to design, think, and innovate about. And it's a hell of a lot more serious. We're all improvising right now. We're all MacGyvering like crazy. We have to ask our teachers to help us, to help our students and their families. But administrators, ask your teachers to help. It isn't fun. It isn't familiar, and it's sure not easy. But we've got to rise to this occasion, and we've got to do it. We're going to get through this thing together, or, or maybe not at all. We're going to have to create time for teachers to share, to be with one another in whatever mode is possible. And it's not crazy to look at some of the rituals and advice around loss and grieving and to try to adapt these to our special situation right now. Some of us have lost loved ones, colleagues, and students, and we've all lost time and a whole lot of familiar things. Time to grieve and reflect is important, and time to work together may be the way forward out of this. I'm going to get a little dark here. We know what caused the cheese to move. It's a terrible disease that's killed nearly 800 people in the county where I live in Massachusetts. And it seems to have especially horrible effects on some children. Sorry about the cheese, but it's still out there somewhere. We're going to have to hunt for it together. Okay. So that's that question dealt with as best I can. Another one, our faculty members wear two hats, the teacher and the advisor advocate. The teacher portion is requiring more of their time than it has ever required before. Any tips on how we can balance the academics and the social emotional learning aspects of what our faculty is responsible for? Okay, as you plan for next year, be sure that whatever your schedule is that you're using has built in time for those community and relational pieces that have been important all along. And whatever your solution to the curriculum and pedagogy challenges might be, make sure that it builds in time for that human interaction, individual interaction between teachers and students, between students and students. Keep your teams and your clubs going in whatever way you can by giving them the kinds of time and attention that they get, that they need when times are normal. Again, it's a, it's a glib answer. I can't tell you how to do this. Each school is different. Each school's culture is different. But recognizing that these things are important and giving them the resource, the one resource that, that is the most crucial and valuable resource in schools and the resource that we can offer, and that's time. So let's try that. Um, another question. Uh, Peter, Brad, can I, can yeah, I answer, that, answer that one too? Do. You know, it seems to me that that's one of the things that we've suggested to schools to do is to adopt and adapt the core standards and teaching competencies um, that I think many of you have seen up on our COVID-19 website, uh, including, uh, including as you adopt and adapt those standards, if you're going down that route, the uh, social emotional learning that you expect from your faculty from the design perspective, the build perspective and the teaching perspective seems to me to make a lot of sense. You wanna try to build for the outcomes that you want, for the competencies, dare I say, that you want. Um, part of that certainly has to involve the community aspect and thinking about that really carefully from the teacher perspective for each of her or his classes it makes a lot of sense to me at this point in time. That's great, thank you. Um, another question, are schools paying faculty to do more training this summer in distance learning? Well, I've got a, an answer to this and we hear that some schools are doing this, yes. And this probably wouldn't be a terrible time to spend some extra professional development resources if you can really get bang for your buck. Uh, Brad may cringe when I, when, I, when I put it this way, but I think it can be helpful to think of total expenses like that as maybe a fraction of a single tuition. Even a big expenditure may not equal one tuition. Is improving the experience enough to keep one family from leaving, from looking somewhere else, worth that kind of expenditure? I'm gonna kind of go with yes. I bet Brad has more to say. 
I totally agree with you, Peter. I think that this is a time uh, that schools absolutely have to be investing uh, quite a lot into their faculty um, and reinvesting a lot into their faculty. Uh, I'll tell you all at one schoolhouse, we actually separate out um, the payments that we make from faculty from course build from the actual teaching that they're doing. We, we give faculty two separate payments. Um, and I think that a lot of schools are going to want to start to move in that type of direction, that you're going to have faculty who are master builders of learning experiences for kids, and you're going to want to compensate them for that um, in, uh, in pretty specific ways. And so I actually, I, I would say that this is a place that schools should be considering quite, quite heavily right now. And those master builders will become a, an incredibly valuable institutional resource. So cultivate Absolutely. Them. Give them, give them all they need. We've got two questions that have come in, Peter. How many more questions do we have still? A couple? I really uh, just have two, one of which I have a Great. very quick answer to. Um, one, this is kind of my favorite question because I don't actually know the answer, but I know where it can be found. What are some ways schools are showcasing and show, sharing great faculty work and great student work this spring? And I don't know the answer to that question, but this is a place where I bet the academic leaders listserv can generate a whole, you know, I, I can see this getting 50 responses. So um, I would highly recommend, uh, Colleen, that you uh, post that one on the academic leaders listserv because I'd love to hear the answers and I'd love to be able to uh, share some of those next time we're all together like this. I think that's a great question. Yeah, there've been a couple, I think, that have come on maybe early in the spring, but that question hasn't been posed probably in about a month. So I'd love to mm -hmm. see that question posed too. And the last one I'm gonna touch today, um, which is, will there be lasting improvements and changes or will we go back to what we were doing before COVID? Okay, <laughs> quickly. The idealist and optimist in me wonders whether this will be the time, for example, when we start looking at learning as something that's intimately related to the lives of learners and the worlds in which they live, that we can give relevance, not just lip service, but attention uh, and the attention it deserves as we think about what and how we're putting together our academic programs. That's just one thing. What else have we learned uh, that's important in the learning process? How can we incorporate these things more intentionally into the learning experiences that we choose to offer and in the ways that we design, build, and deliver these? I think the world could be our oyster right now if we're willing to grasp at the possibilities and not just be in a hurry to get back to whatever the status quo was before. We've, we've been given Again, I think I said this last week, it's an opportunity we didn't ask for. It's an opportunity we didn't really want, but we've got it. Let's use it to make things better for every kid. So Peter, we've gotten in three questions. And again, folks, if you have additional ones, let's click the Q&A button and, and put them in here. I'm actually gonna go in reverse order because they're a little bit easier to handle that way. Uh, the first question okay. comes in, uh, can you address the question of faculty who are not comfortable returning to campus in this fall? Uh, campus this fall, if that's going to be a possibility. We've completed one survey of employees and plan for another this fall. Our administrators are concerned that there may be last minute decisions by faculty in August not to return to campus to teach. How can the administration best handle this? So there's a couple of answers to this question that I'm going to go through. And Peter, you probably have a thought or two on this. Um, my, my first, uh, my first suggestion would be to make really clear what the expectations are going into this fall and make clear to faculty what you're expecting this fall to start to look like so that you invite the conversation of whether or not they want to teach in that way now rather than as a last minute decision. That is, you want to give your faculty enough clarity so that they can decide now, am I ready for this? Am I ready for this build towards an online class or a hybrid setting for next year? Or is that something that I need to opt out of? Encourage them to opt in or opt out now rather than later. And so as clear as you can be with those expectations, I think you're gonna want to be. The second piece of advice um, comes from some of my attorney friends, and that is make sure that you ask your school attorneys some of these questions. 
Um, I have heard advice from a number of attorneys that you're going to want to make sure that your job descriptions are super clear, what constitutes a teaching job, and you're going to want to consider both relevant uh, federal and state and local laws uh, in this regard, and know that, that, that there's uh, quite a lot of legislation pending in this area too. And so this will be a little bit of a moving target potentially as the summer goes along. This is one of those places though that academic leaders absolutely need to make sure that they are engaging with their school council uh, uh, on, um, in order to prepare effectively. But again, the more that we can help faculty understand what the fall may look like and give them the opportunity to opt out now, the better off we're gonna be. And I, Brad, when you say opt out, is there, do you think there's some possibility we may have faculty who are gonna work be ready to work on campus and faculty who will want to do their work from home? Is that a, is that a viable model? That, we, that may be, that? Peter, yeah. but in the many schools, I can imagine also that that's not a tenable model. And no. so this is, this is the place that I think you have to be super clear as, as to what the expectation is for next fall and yes. what you're building towards, towards next fall, and then working with your council on, um, on, on that. Um, the and next question that comes, uh, sorry, I interrupted you, Peter. What was that? I was going to say, this is a place where kind of situational awareness at the leadership level is going to be so important. Um, and bringing um, your counsel in, being really aware of what the, the legal and, uh, and even the, the medical and public health situations are uh, looking to get the best advice from your council, from your state, from regional authorities, whatever it might be, because things are going to be potentially in a great deal of flux and being able to respond in the, in the moment, in the instant is going to be really important. Yeah, and, and so this is where I'm, I'm gonna take a question that just came in on this right now too. Uh, this is where my friend, uh, Megan Mann, the legal counsel for NIS says that Every, all leaders on campus need to be alert towards the conversations and agile, be ready to change uh, as needed. Uh, Allison asked the uh, question that kind of follows up on this. What about faculty who can't come back to campus because of an underlying health condition? Again, that is a place you need to involve your counsel in. You absolutely have to involve your general counsel in some of those conversations. And you have to be alert to understand when a faculty member is trying to signal to you that they have an underlying health condition without actually telling you that that's the case. Um, we cover this a little bit actually in the administrator training course as, uh, as I did an interview with Megan on this topic. Um, hopefully we'll be able to get Megan over to this webinar at some point soon to maybe dive a little bit deeper here. Okay. Um, again though, alert, agile, and involve your counsel please. Uh, Justin asked the question, any advice for academic leaders entering new schools in July and trying to lead them through this time? So what if you're heading into a brand new school this time? Peter? Oh, I've got friends who are in this situation and uh, all I can s say is that this is the time when, you know, we always tell people entering a new school to sort of think like an anthropologist to really, you know, figure out what the what the political systems, what the belief systems are, what the media, the mediums of exchange are uh, in in a new community, uh, what what matters, uh, who holds the who holds power in certain ways, and I would just say that you're going to have to ramp up your anthropological uh, skills to a, a a very very high level. Uh, ask your uh, eighth or ninth grade um, history or social studies teachers what models that they use. Uh, when they're presenting this question to students um, and go there because information is information is your friend. A, a sense of the landscape is your friend. Um, you're going to have to do a tremendous amount of listening. You're going to have to ask a million questions uh, and you're going to have to be able to develop your own filters for which answers are the ones that are going to be uh, that are going to matter uh, in the in the community as a whole. Um, you know, you may have been hired with a particular expectation that we're going to work on this or that strategic priority um, that looked really important back in January when the offer was made. Uh, but things are going to be different now and it's just a matter of, of digging in, digging in, digging in and, uh, and, and knowing that, again, as I said, we can get through this. We're all going to have to get through this and we're going to get through it 
by working as schools, as, as teams, uh, your, your administrative team, your faculty as a team. Don't think of them as your, your faculty anymore. Think of them as your teaching team. And they work with, uh, they, and they scrimmage regularly with the uh, administrative team and they, they, they swap roles a bunch. So keep up that team theory, that team model. Peter, that's, that's really good. The only thing I'd add to that is just make sure that you're, to the extent you can get the student's lived experience voice mm -hmm. as soon as in that process as you possibly can. Understand what the student lived experience has been this spring. Yep. So Kennedy asks, uh, uh, if we have any strategies for beginning the scheduling conversation anew. She notes at a uh, pre-K through 12 school, our normal schedule was scrapped for an emergency distance model. We learned a lot um, and hope to be able to return to campus at least some in the fall. But when initiating conversations, everyone's falling, falling back into the old model and struggling with a mission-driven conceptual vision as a starting place. Any suggestions on framing the conversation to move forward with solutions rather than focusing on obstacles? So Peter, I know you have a lot of thoughts on scheduling. Can I add in my two cents just on um, uh, toggling for a second? Please so do. Kennedy, we think that schools are going to really want to make sure that they're crafting a schedule for next year that allows for easiest toggling between being on campus and online. And so your schedule next year will almost certainly look different than what it was this spring and almost certainly look different than it was previous to that. That I know is a challenge in itself. Um, our suggestion is that schools uh, create some type of Monday through Friday calendar or, uh, schedule flow and cadence to what that Monday through Friday looks like. Our suggestion is that way because we know that there are many different models out there that you could be thinking towards for next year, whether it's one week on campus, one week off campus, one day on campus, one day off campus, any number of those variations. It's going to be easier if you're schedule is tied to what is happening in the world outside of your school, which is why a Monday through Friday schedule and cadence probably makes more sense going into next year. In normal times, um, at schools, we have the ability to live in a bubble where we don't necessarily have to think about what's going on outside of our school walls and don't have to tie into that kind of Monday through Friday schedule that most of the working world does. These aren't normal times and the best that we can probably link into that, the easier it's going to be on our families and on our kids in creating routines. Peter, I know you have some other thoughts there too. Well, I, I have lots of thoughts on schedules. Uh, and right now, I, I think the thought that's going to make the most sense and be the most useful as I see our time is uh, coming to an end is to, to start with this mantra. There is no such thing as the perfect schedule. In, in any circumstance, there, all you can do with a schedule really is minimize losses, minimize the things you're not going to be able to, to accomplish um, because of whatever the, the constraints are. And obviously, we're, we're dealing with a whole new set of constraints that we sometimes we can imagine and sometimes we can't. And what Brad was saying about the, the week-long schedule, I, I'm, I'm a fan of a, if a school has a schedule that works for them, yay. But if it's a seven day or nine day rotation, um, that's gonna be much harder to adapt to uh, the changing circumstances if, if they are indeed going to be week, week by week as they may well be. Um, I'd love to come back and talk more about this at some point in the future. Maybe we'll have a whole session on scheduling at some point, Peter. But we promised you all that we're going to get you uh, in and out of here within 30 minutes. So we thank you all for your time uh, on this Wednesday at noon and look forward to um, look forward to seeing you all next week. Uh, it's great to great to have this community out here. And uh, again, folks, if you have the time uh, tomorrow afternoon to attend our academic leaders meetup, I know that a lot of folks are finding that really valuable. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Brad.